Good morning, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here among such smart, intelligent, and learned people. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about, what you learn, how you learn, but maybe not quite in the way that you think. How would you describe the condition of your fingernails? Wonderful. So I'm not really interested in the condition of your fingernails. I am interested in how you look at your fingernails. See, when I was a child uh, playing on the playground, a student came up to me and said, what color are your fingernails? And I looked, and before I could answer, he said, ah, you're a girl. And I'm like, no, I'm a boy. He goes, no, you look at your fingernails like a girl does. And off he ran. And that was the entire exchange. And I'm wondering what just happened, that I'm a girl, that I look my fingernails wrong. So it stuck with me. I, as an adult, I'm a teacher, a science teacher. And I began to wonder, you know, where did that come from? Where did this idea that how we look at our fingernails says something about our gender orientation? Is it true? How did that kid come to ask me that question? What did I learn from that experience? And why have I remembered it for so long? So I did some research, and I found out that in 1956, December 23rd, the Sunday Times, there was an article, are you M or F, masculine or feminine? And there was a series of questions. First question was, how do you light your cigarette? The second question was, how do you look at your fingernails? Supposedly, the answers that one gives tells you something about your gender. So if you look at your fingernails with your palm down and your fingers outstretched, that's considered feminine. If you look at your fingernails with your palm up and your fingers curled, that means you're masculine. Now, this is all bogus. It's not true. I even couldn't find any studies that supported this idea, but it did help sell some newspapers. And then I began to think, okay, how did it last for 20 years that that information trickled down through uh, family gatherings, dinner table, conversation, uh, cocktail parties, until finally it diffused 20 years later to that kid on the playground who finally asked me that question. And so this got me thinking. It's about out-of-home learning, about informal learning. We are all familiar with what we learn in school, but school represents about 5% of our entire lives is spent in a classroom with a teacher. And of that, a very small fraction is with a science teacher. So that means 95% of our lives is outside of school, where we are learning all the time. And the question I have is, what are we learning and how? And what does it mean? And the one aspect of this out-of-school experience and learning I want to focus on is called out-of-home media. We all experience this as billboards, posters, and placards. And you might think, yeah, I don't even give those a second look. They're not that important. But I'm here to convince you that they're not only important, but they are significant. And that they are teaching you every day. Thirsty? Have a Coke. Hungry? Eat at McDonald's. Want to drive a truck? Buy a Ram. These are all messages that we receive outside the home. Now, out-of-home media has expanded to be radio and television and uh, the web. You're online constantly. Your Twitter feed, your Facebook account, all of this is now out-of-home media. And it can be a cause of good. In the 1970s, the United States had a terrible problem with litter. It was not unusual to drive down the road in the car in front of you, you would see someone throw a bag of trash out their window. It would be on the side of the highway. And you go, oh, you, know, you don't want your McDonald's bag with all your stuff, so you throw it out. This became a huge problem. And uh, there was an initiative called Keep America Beautiful, and it was a, basically an out-of-home media um, campaign to teach people that littering was bad. 
It featured a Native American who was shedding a tear over what we were doing to this land. The campaign was highly successful. The culture changed. Littering became taboo. Put your trash in a trash can. Don't be a litter bug. And now we really have a much cleaner nation because of this campaign. It can also be used for evil. In World War II, the Nazis used out-of-home media to spread their poisonous doctrine of hatred very effectively. Uh, it's so powerful that it can make you do things that will kill you. The tobacco com companies used out-of-home media as their primary weapon to convince citizens that using tobacco products and smoking was not only healthy and good for you and fun and wonderful, but it was, a, it was something you should enjoy and embrace. S they did it through billboards, magazines, movies, TV, radio. They bombarded generations with this message, and it was extremely effective. Today, it's going, it's still happening. The fight is switching to different topics, but the media is the same. We live in a world where the climate is changing, and it's changing because of us. There's no question about this. And yet there are those who want to spread disinformation and doubt because it's in their best interest. Shell Oil put together the Let's Go campaign, highly funded, highly expensive, pervasive messaging about Shell Oil taking care of the problem. You don't have to worry about it. We'll take care of it. Everything's going to be just fine. Now, in a world faced with a changing climate, this might not be the best solution. And placating you is a problem. One of my favorite campaigns is the Clean Coal campaign. Clean coal, very popular in the coal states. Well, coal is not clean. By nature, it's dirty. It's filled with impurities. When you burn it, you get lots of sulfur dioxide. There is research to make it clean, but so far that hasn't been so successful. So the idea here is if we say it enough times, it becomes true. Clean coal. So I'm here to talk to you about my research that I'm doing with a group of very talented people. And we ask the question, what if we took these spaces that are used to change behavior and get people to buy things and to do things that may be questionable, what if we use these spaces to engage them in meaningful learning experiences? Not tell them what to think or how to think, but just to engage them, to get them talking asking questions and making decisions for themselves. So we have two projects. One's called Science2Go.org and the other is called Cool Science. Science2Go.org is a campaign of 12 months in which we're in the last month now that's on the Boston T, the red and orange lines. And our purpose is to engage the 500,000 riders a day who, take, who ride those lines and engage them with the opportunity to learn something about climate change science as it impacts Boston. So we tell the story of Ozzy, our ostrich, his story of awakening to the reality, relevance, and hope that climate change poses for Boston. And this is a, a, a slide, a poster from our phase two, the new normal, and it addresses rising sea levels and its impact on Boston. The engaging the commuter, giving them a chance to see these spaces as something different has been a challenge. We think it's been quite successful, and it's always exciting to see these kinds of opportunities to engage people in interesting um, learning um, outside the home. So coolscience.net is a program in the Commonwealth where we ask K through 12 students to express their understanding about climate change through art. We then take the best art and we put it on public display 
on the inside and outside of mass transit buses throughout the Lowell Regional Transit Authority. And in this one project, we engage formal learning in schools with teachers and students and parents, get them talking about climate change science. And we use the best products of those efforts to engage the riding public who ride the buses to and from work every day. They can look at this artwork. They can engage with it. All the media is smartphone ready, so they can ask a question, get an answer. They can swipe and go to the, the web page. They can ask a question. They can uh, engage, post on our Facebook, follow us on Twitter. The idea is not to tell them what to think, but engage them in the opportunity to think. So I like to think of this, trying to determine how effective are these projects, how successful are we, is a shoreline metaphor. So imagine a shoreline, a nice sandy beach, and you've got the waves lapping on the beach. The shoreline is the audience. The lapping of the waves is the constant bombardment of media messages and images that out-of-home media sends to you every day through your waking hours. And what we're doing is we're adding a bucket of red water to the ocean and seeing if we change the color of the beach at all. It's hard. It's difficult and challenging, but that doesn't stop us. We're in the middle of collecting a lot of data. To date, we're very encouraged by what we see. And I'm looking forward to collecting the final rounds of data in the months ahead. So what does this mean to you? What can you do as a result of this? One, be more aware of your environment. When you leave today, I want you to be more cognizant of who is out there and the messages that are being directed at you. Number two, question the messages that you see. Be a critical consumer of information. Who is sending the message? Who is benefiting from the message? Is it something that is good for me or is it something that's good for somebody else? Think about these things. Be aware. Be active. And finally, discuss your experiences with others. Keep, bring this to the open. You see a billboard that's questionable? Raise it. Talk about it. Share it with friends and family. Deconstruct it. Take its power away if you think it's bad. If you think it's good, promote it. That's your choice. But you've got to do it, you've got to be aware of it, you've got to know it, you've got to think about it. So I want to thank you for letting me be part of your out-of-home learning experience. I hope that you allow me and some of these ideas about learning outside of school in your heads to marinate, to think about today, and to reflect upon tomorrow. Thank you very much.